Well, happy Easter, everyone. As we gather, it's so beautiful to be together. One year ago, we celebrated the vigil in an empty church, and many of you joined us by way of the internet, and how wonderful it is to be together again. And as we gather this most holy night, we remember a few things. And first, we remember that the, the church is filled with great tradition. The church is filled with great tradition. There are capital T traditions, and there are small t traditions within the church. Capital T tradition, of course, our sacraments and the whole body and treasure of faith, but within the sacraments and the treasured body of faith, we have the, the way we celebrate the sacraments and the way we celebrate our faith. The, the sacraments tonight will baptize eight people and confirm 16. And these are capital T traditions. As we celebrate the Paschal Mystery, these three days, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, tonight, capital T tradition of the church. There are small T traditions of the church, too, local celebrations, perhaps ethnic customs. Twelve noon, we baptized the, not baptized, we blessed the Easter basket, you know, which is an old Polish custom, perhaps for other uh, ethnic backgrounds as well, and as I said then, repeat now, among the incense and the flowers and the candles, there's no smell like kielbasa in church, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, these beautiful traditions, and if you hold to some of your ethnic traditions, you know that uh, all of these foods have great religious meaning, really, for us in faith, small tree tea traditions. Here at St. Greg's, we have some small T traditions. Of course, one of them is singing the second reading, the Exodus reading, which was absolutely beautifully done. We thank you. And uh, among some of those small T traditions, I think I, I've started them. One began back in 2018. 2018, I had a fairly substantial stack of peeps. You know, how many of you remember that? And um, in that homily, I paralleled the beginnings of Peeps from 1953, and I paralleled the way that they've grown and developed and paralleled that to God's relationship with his people. I don't think you'll find that published in any theological journal, <laughs> but I think it made some sense. And in 2019, you know, I continued that small T tradition and I pulled out a, a smaller stack of peeps and introduced to you all the new flavors that were brought about that year. And uh, certainly related that to the diversity of the church. And even though we are, are one body of Christ, we are diverse as well. Last year, of course, we took a break from the peeps because we weren't together. And uh, I had a very large poster board size picture of the Grinch because uh, we know the Grinch who stole Christmas, right? When we talked about the Grinch who stole Easter because so we couldn't be here together. But just as uh, the Grinch who stole Christmas, didn't stop Christmas, the Who's in Whoville, even though every last can of Who hash was gone. You know, they still gathered in the circle in the town and they, they sang their Christmas song and transformed the heart of the Grinch. Well, this year, a few people have asked me what we're going to do in the homily. And I really have not talked about it until now, but uh, now I have my little bag of tricks here. And uh, this year, we did introduce a new flavor of peeps. And they're called hot tamale peeps. <laughs> did you see those hot tamale peeps? They should be on the screens. The area, beautiful technology. You know, 
the hot tamale peeps. And uh, the, the ad, if you really followed it, you know, not that I have nothing better to do, but I do research these things. You know, <laughs> the ad was, quote, get fired up for spring with sizzling sweet hot tamale peeps. Get fired up. I liked that. Well, a couple Wednesdays ago, probably three now that I count, we had a, a fiery moment at the rectory. Thankfully, not, you know, one requiring the fire department to come, but it was Wednesday after we had confessions and we had dinner together. And, and as we sat at the dinner table, Father Paul has this box of three hot sauces. And uh, he doesn't know I stole one of them tonight. <laughs> and uh, he pulled out this bottle of, of triple X hot sauce. Now, if I remember it right, he put a drop or two on his food and uh, immediately, and I mean immediately, <laughs> ran for a glass of milk <laughs> to cool the fire which had begun, right? And of course, he dared Father Moses to do the same. And Father Moses, you know, he's from Nigeria. This stuff is like water to them. <laughs> I think he had two or three two teaspoons for just drank it down. He said, I don't see the problem, you know, <laughs> at all. There was quite a little fire at the rectory that night. Well, you know, the simple question, what fires you up? What fires you up? One thing that fires me up is email. <laughs> I don't like email. <laughs> Maybe you don't like email. Some email is fine. You know, some really wonderful notes of thanks and perhaps little greetings and so on. That's wonderful, sincerely. And of course, there's the, the junk email and the ads. And uh, unknown to me, I have many relatives in India who want to live, leave me millions of dollars. They email me all of the time, you know. And then there are the emails that fire me up. You know, there are some emails of, of complaint and concern. And some of them are valid, of course, they really are. And some of them I, I get rather fired up about and frustrated over because um, they lack common sense and reason. And I sit there reading them, rereading them, thinking, how am I possibly going to use reason to respond to a message that completely lacks reason. I get fired up. Not necessarily a good thing. Well, what fires you up? For some of us, it may be politics, might be the news, no shortage of things therein. The economy, that's always a nice one, and certainly the many, many social issues that face us in the world today those things can all fire us up. But these things really fire us up just like, you know, my emails do. Usually not in a very positive way. Hmm? We get a little frustrated and knotted up inside. Well, what really fires you up in a positive way? It's really the question to ask. What fires you up in a positive way? Well, on Holy Thursday, when we began this liturgy, you know, these three days are really one long liturgy. They're not three separate things. And when we began, Father Moses, hopefully I correct, correctly quote him, and if not, he'll politely correct me after Mass is over. Uh, <laughs> but I believe in the homily towards the end, Father Moses made a very, very clear and direct point that what we do at this altar as we celebrate the Eucharist directly connects to the service that we're about. And of course, on Holy Thursday night, we, we washed the feet of 12 people. I believe I remember you saying that correctly. Are you fired up over the Eucharist? Are you fired up over the Eucharist really feeding you to, to go and to serve other people in many ways? Yesterday, Father Paul led us in the traditional Good Friday service, and 
you know, I was teasing him after because he gave a, a lengthy list of some of the challenges and problems and burdens, and I told him I was really hoping we were going to, you know, grow beyond that, and thankfully he did. He landed the plane well, and he gave us, without doubt, without question, hope. He fired us up with the death and the resurrection of Christ, Christ crucified, Christ risen, to give us hope even in the midst of all of the problems and the burdens that we endure in the world today. I think I correctly remember that. Tonight, what did we begin with? We began with fire, didn't we? I have to thank Jay Zagora. He, every year he, he does the fire for us, you know, and we thank you for doing that for us. And, I remember a few years ago with 60 mile an hour winds out there. You know, today a little bit of rain, <laughs> but we survived and we thank you. But we began with, with fire. We blessed the fire. We used that new fire to light the very candle, the Paschal candle, the light of Christ. And from that very fire that we blessed outside and lit this candle, Eventually, each one of us held our own candle, reminding us that we are the light of Christ in the world today. Fire, blessed, and made holy. Fire consumes what's in its immediate presence. Are you consumed with the fire? Are you consumed with the fire of Christ? Are you consumed to be the light of Christ in the world today? It's a great question to ask. If we continue to reflect on what fires you up, we look at the readings we just shared, and of course the beautiful reading of, of, of Genesis. God the Father is really on fire. What did he do? He gave order to chaos. In one week's time, six days, really, seventh day he rested, he gave order to chaos. And God was on fire to create. And what did he create to be most important but you and me, man and woman, in his own image, image and likeness, to be his, his light, his fire in the world. Of course, we hear about Moses as we heard the beautiful second reading sung. And Moses was on fire too. Well, first of all, he went to the burning bush and he, he knew he was in the presence of God. But he was on fire. I don't know about you, takes an awful lot of faith to believe walking through that Red Sea that those waters, uh, walls of water were going to stay at walls of water. He was on fire as he led the Israelite people from slavery in Egypt to freedom. He was on fire all through the time in the desert, not just because it was a desert and it was hot. He was on fire with the Lord and would often go to be in the presence of the Lord to pray, and we would hear in the scripture, his face would radiate because he was in the presence of God. And then we heard Ezekiel, the prophet, he was on fire too, giving great hope and the promise of restoration to the Israelite people. And we hear St. Paul in the epistle reading, he's on fire. Of course, he was putting the Christians to death, goes through conversion, and now becomes one of those greatest of all preachers of all time of the faith. He was on fire. And then in the gospel, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, they're on fire early in the morning, very first thing, they go to the tomb. And we know the story well that understanding Jesus wasn't there, they go to the apostles, Peter and John and the others, and they come to the tomb and they too, consumed with fire, particularly Pentecost Day, the gift of the Spirit. They're on fire, and they're speaking in tongues and foreign languages, and they're going across the world to spread the good news, to build the church. Well, this Easter, what is really your response to this invitation to be fire? What is your response to the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ? Is tonight just another night? Or is it just another Easter? Or is there fire within you?
or at least the, the desire for that fire to burn within, that fire of love and faithfulness to the Lord, a fire that maybe wasn't there before. Easter is not just good news. Easter is fire. Easter is life-changing, and, and Easter, like fire, is all-consuming of you and me in the presence of the joy of what we celebrate. Well, we come to the present moment, and what is it that we know? We see fire in our midst. We have eight adults wanting to be baptized tonight to become members of the body of Christ. That's fire. And uh, I could go one by one. Each has a tremendous story, but one that I will simply mention and highlight in particular. Connor, one of our high school teenagers, junior at Nichols, last year, I believe was May or so, came to see me in my office because all on his own, not told by anyone, all on his own, asked about being baptized. That's fire. That is fire in our midst. You know, in the time period when we see fewer and fewer people celebrating faith, and many of us worry more and more about our young people, here we have in our parish a high school teenager coming forward desiring to be baptized. That's fire in our midst. And in all, eight, tremendous fire with a very different story, each and every one. The same for all 16 to be confirmed. Fire, desiring, not as a high schooler to be confirmed, but as an adult approaching the sacrament to complete their full initiation into the church. That's fire in our midst. For those to be baptized, our eight brothers and sisters, in a moment you're going to receive, you know, your baptismal candle. Your godparent will come, and Deacon Paul is going to be the one to risk his life getting the actual light from the tall paschal candle, you know. But your godparent will accept that and hand that on to you, and you will be told in the instruction to keep the flame of faith alive in your heart fire in your heart. Well, I don't want to just be a flame for the rest of your life. I want a blazing fire. And I know all of you are perfectly capable. You have great examples who've led you here. Your family, your sponsors, and all of our, our great RCIA team. You're being led to be saints. That is what we're all being led to do. And in the present moment, we look to the saints. And sometimes we can look at the apostles or Mary Magdalene and think, well, they, all this stuff we read about is nice, but that was 2,000 years ago, and how does that relate to us now? Sometimes we look at the saints, they're hundreds of years ago, well, that doesn't relate to us now. And a number of you have heard me speak about blessed Carlo Acutis, Bless Carlo Acutis, his picture is up there on the screen, died in 2006 at the age of 15. He looks like one of our teenagers today. He died from leukemia. He was diagnosed in a little over a week. He had died. And this past October, Pope Francis beatified him. He already had one miracle attributed to him, young boy who was born with terrible illness, a deformed organ. Nothing could be done for him. He touched one of Carlo's uh, t-shirts and was completely healed. No medical reason. Nothing other than direct intervention of God. And this young man, when he was baptized, his parents were not church-going people. And when he was just a little bopper, barely able to walk, 
Every time he walked by a church with his parents, he insisted they lived in Italy. They insisted, he insisted to go inside. And when he went into every church, he would run up to the cross and he would kiss the cross. And he would always tell his parents, we need to take flowers to the lady, meaning to the Blessed Mother. And when he was seven years of age, he himself asked to receive First Holy Communion. And his parents, so touched by his devotion, they returned to the active practice of their own faith. And this young man is known for his great love for the poor. From the time he received his first communion at the age of seven, he would go daily to Mass. And uh, many beautiful stories of his care for the poor, but when he was just a little boy, he would walk by this indigent man, homeless man, every day back and forth from church, and he took his own money. And he went and he bought a sleeping bag to give to this man. He was known to round up all of the teenagers, his peers, to go to the soup kitchens to work for the poor. And he was a man of great devotion to the Eucharist. He would go to daily Mass, and after Mass was over, would just sit before the tabernacle, as his parish priest had reported. And he called his fellow teenagers to lead a chaste life, to lead a pure life. As he entered in high school himself and the challenges that meet our young people in that area, he called them daily to live that chastity. He was diagnosed with leukemia, and as I said, about a week or so later died. There are many quotes attributed to him, and I'll end my homily by sharing them with you, and maybe one of them will really strike you, because he is a young man who definitely was on fire. One of his hallmark quotes, the Eucharist is the highway to heaven. Beautiful quote. The Eucharist is the highway to heaven. We have eight among us who will receive Eucharist for the first time tonight, the highway to heaven. Secondly, he said, to be always united with Jesus, this is my plan of life. To always be united with Jesus, this is my plan of life. What a great philosophy of life, a thesis statement for us all. Next, when we face the sun, we get a tan. But when we stand before Jesus in the Eucharist, we become holy. When we face the sun, we get a tan. But when we stand before Jesus in the Eucharist, we become holy. Call for us all to strive for holiness, day in and day out. Fourth, he said right when he was ready to die, he told his mother very clearly in the hospital, he said, I know that I'm not going to come out of the hospital alive. I know that I'm going to die. And he said, I'm happy to die because I've lived my life without wasting even a minute of it on anything unpleasing to God. That's fire. I'm happy to die because I lived my life without wasting even a minute of it on anything unpleasing to God. Most of us fear that moment to die and hear this young man at 15 was happy because he knew his intimacy with the Father. And finally, this one I love maybe the most, we are born as originals, but most people die as photocopies. We're born as originals, created in God's image and likeness, unique with talents and abilities, things that God has asked us to accomplish for him as his disciples in the world today. We're born as originals, but most of us die as photocopies because we give in to the ways of the world. We lose the fire. Maybe it becomes a smolder. Maybe it's completely extinguished. This Easter, I ask you to be that fire 
Rekindle that fire if it's grown a little dim and be that fire. Look to the examples of a blessed Carlo Acutis. Look to the lived examples of the many tremendous individuals we have right in this very parish. Look to the example of the eight individuals we're about to baptize and the 16 we are about to confirm in the fire of their faith. May we too be renewed.